Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is there a random sighting on uh, citations on where Can you say that a little bit louder, please? Are there just random citations on where they can be, or can they be at certain places at certain times? So I think, so the question is whether or not there are random citations about where people can be or if people can be in certain, certain places at certain <laughs> times. That depends a lot on the jurisdiction. So some of the, some cities have trespass laws that explicitly state they can be applied to public places once a person has been asked to leave. So under that law, if a police officer asks you to leave and you don't, you can receive a trespass citation. Um, cities maybe use those ordinances for different purposes. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to discern a lot of that from our data. There's also a lot of laws about park closures, so you're not able to be in a park after a certain hour. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, follow up yeah, question? Yeah, that was my second follow-up question was, uh, are all parks off for that? So that also depends on the jurisdiction, but a lot, of the most common park law that we would see is that you cannot uh, be in a park during the hours the park is closed, which um, often will be like from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. or from sundown to sunup, and if you're in the park during those hours, then you can be cited. I, I will just add one other small fact to that, like it was what Ali was saying. Um, there was one city that we saw uh, a decrease in trespass laws one year, but then we also saw that the same increase in citations under the park curfew law. Um, so we can kind of see they're citing at the same level for the same basic offense, they're just using different ordinances, and that actually happened in one of the cities we looked at. But you had two columns, like I think it was one from 2013, one from 2014, <coughs> and then the percentage of citations going to homeless uh, individuals. Um, and it seemed like the numbers increased considerably from one year to the next. Do you have any theory as to why that changed? Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's the next one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Um, and so we actually, uh, I, we're working on what exactly the charge we're going to We're going to try to put up uh, some of the actual citation information that we have, but we haven't finalized the form that we're going to make that available. Um, but I can say, under all of these ordinances, there was that steady increase both in uh, the total number of citations to homeless individuals and the percentage of citations under that ordinance to homeless individuals. As to why, that's a little bit outside the scope of what we researched. Um, I will say uh, something that came up in multiple cities that probably had at least some impact uh, in around 20, 2012 uh, was the Occupy movement. Uh, there's a lot of things that are wrapped up with that uh, that might account for some of it, but clearly that movement is not nearly the presence it is now, and the status of percentage and total numbers remain incredibly high. So it's hard to say. In the, in the back so, there. so we're going to have uh, folks with a question come up, here. Uh, come awesome. up to the Perfect. microphone. Um, I've got a, a question, and who did you so, call on? <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so but first, thank you for all of your work. Um, secondly, uh, so as you said at the beginning of this presentation, microphones behind uh, thingy over this there. is underrepresented of the actual costs uh, for a number of different reasons. And so, um, so two questions. One, um, I know that NOFA requests or Freedom of Information Acts, um, they're, they're not free, so, um, which has been part of D. Hull's difficulty in arguing these things. So um, if we could get a picture of how much it costs just to find out this information. And then second, secondly, um, if you have, if you've done any work on trying to do an estimate of <coughs> Um, that greater cost. It's requests varied across the state, across the cities, but a majority of them said, well, we can go and dig through all these citations and, and hand look at those, but that would take many hours and thousands of dollars. And so we had um, a somewhat generous budget given to us from our dean, Dean Marty Katz of the University of Denver Law School, um, but they didn't, it didn't have enough in it to look at all of the citations and all of the data that the cities were going to charge us for. 
And so we picked and choose. We chose the cities that uh, we knew that would be representative, Denver in particular. And so for the um, six cities that we sort of highlight for the cost report, we, we did pay a little bit more for those. Um, how much would it cost to actually do a comprehensive <coughs> look? Um, we, did not, we did not estimate that. It was outside um, our private university budget, if you can imagine. Um, and uh, and an estimate as to any work you've done on an estimate as to how much it costs the state uh, to enforce these. Uh, do you, I guess, how representative is this figure of $5 million? The numbers from uh, <coughs> December 2014 citation of those five ordinances. So we then applied them to other cities. We utilized the uh, jail costs for each city, so we didn't utilize Denver's and apply it to Durango's. However, in the sense of knowing explicitly what, say, Durango's 15 citations, how many of those resulted in jail time, or in Colorado Springs, we didn't have access to that. Um, hence why we utilized Denver as a case study, because they had such transparent information. Um, and so it is an estimate, and it is a projection, yet um, we feel very confident in the numbers that we utilized for Denver, and um, by tinkering with them a little bit to apply to um, a very small portion of the ordinances that are outside um, of Denver and different municipalities, um, we feel pretty confident that five or three point one million dollars um, is a valid number. I, I think that about nineteen ordinances, if you count Denver and the other cities, there are three hundred and fifty one ordinances that we counted. So we have no idea if you looked at the citations written under all three hundred and fifty one what that cost number would be and it would cost many thousands of dollars to get the data to find that out. Um, so this is not even close to representative of either the citations issued across the state or the collateral costs associated with being put in jail. So sort of the cost of having uh, a criminal record and how that impacts your job search and your education, the cost of being in jail instead of being at school, we just didn't have a way to estimate those costs. So this is just a way to show the state that what we're doing by using municipal ordinances to criminalize is not free. It costs money directly, uh, but this is very, very underrepresentative of the total cost to the state. You already answered my first question, which was about any idea of the cost of criminalization. I think page 28 of this report is the scariest, um, that idea that being incarcerated prevents you from escaping the situation at all, the cost that has both to the individual and to the economy. The second question to um, Ali con on the Constitution, or to Ellie. Uh, Ellie, sorry. Is there, a, uh, is there a constitutional argument against prohibiting someone from going into housing based on a, a criminal record? Because it seems like that should be something which is against any constitution that promises liberty to individuals. The, I, I mean, that question is beyond the scope of this report. Uh, certainly other uh, advocates have made equal protection claims. Uh, however, thus far, the Supreme Court of the United States has not ruled as such. It seems as though Professor Rand has something to add. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that because um, this is one area that I've looked at pretty extensively which is that um, there is a movement to sort of ban the box, right? To ask questions on employment applications for one's criminal background, right? And um, there have been several cases that have gone through the courts that um, where, where advocates have challenged, actually, that it violates the Civil Rights Act to, because it has a disproportionate effect on people of color because they have more contacts with the criminal justice system. And so those have actually been successful in several cases. So I think maybe not a constitutional challenge, but a statutory challenge based on one's, um, on one's race. Um, my addressing question is for all the families and all the people out there, because I heard there were cutbacks on uh, Section 8 living, and that needs to be where are the disconnected peoples and parties going to go where they don't get criminalized for being on the street then? So I think that um, first off, I just want to remind that we really tried to keep our scope in the report um, limited and 
a way that multiple audiences could take the information and advocate um, for the homeless communities all around Colorado. We are aware that there has been a reduction in Section 8 vouchers, and there's been a balance between, you know, there's an argument that's saying some of that money is going to other affordable housing um, developments. So I don't think that um, Denver is unique or the state of Colorado is unique to that struggle, um, but that was not specifically something that we looked into. Um, we didn't feel like that was something we could truly advocate in that direction. We just focused on the criminalization part of the citations that are um, criminalized homelessness. So, so you, you did mention um, uh, alternatives that were more cost effective. So I'm wondering if that might answer part of her question. And then we have more. We focused on is housing first programs. Uh, Denver does have a housing first program. And again, um, a lot of this focus was Denver specific because Denver had the most transparent information. But Housing First programs focus and basically flip the idea that until you know you stop using drugs or you get off the street or you don't you get a job, we won't put you in housing. They flip that on their head. And they say that we're gonna give you and we're gonna put you into a house so that then we can deal with the issues or the root causes of why you might be living on the street. It's been extremely successful in multiple states, including Utah, um, a very conservative state. And um, it's, it's, done, it's a really powerful um, program that Denver is, has a small program developing. The second one was rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing is a federal program or a federal um, methodology of housing. Um, it focuses because a lot of Housing First programs focus on the chronically homeless. So someone who has been on the streets, living on the streets for more than a year. A lot of individuals, especially with this economic time and the, um, the, the, unability, the inability to gain affordable housing, have become recently homeless. Rapid Rehousing focuses on developing um, resources and housing for individuals who have just recently become homeless in the hopes that those individuals are easier to reintegrate and assure that they get the services as well. The last alternative we focused, is, focused on was um, a problem-solving court method. Denver specifically right now has a recovery court program that um, has 95% of the 200 individuals um, are homeless. In that process of developing the recovery court program, they estimated that it cost Denver $11 million um, in the year to deal to deal with the, their medical costs, um, their if these individuals going to detox, all these different services that the state was providing. Yet, through their recovery uh, court, court and utilizing the problem solving court method, um, they have been able to reduce their costs extensively. But moving aside from just the cost for a second, a lot of those individuals now have reintegrated into society and have jobs, are very, very successful people. And so um, we wanted to support the use of problem-solving courts in other municipalities as well. Yes, well, I would like to know about the <laughs> amendment to the Constitution and what does it have to do with criminalization of homeless people? Is, is unconstitutional. We have not taken a look at whether or not these ordinances violate different types of constitutional amendments or claims or statutory claims. So we really focused on sort of whether or not when you say you can't sit here, you know, when, you, when an ordinance says you can't um, lay down here in this public place, you can't put a blanket on you, really what they're doing is they're saying we are, we are prohibiting actions that are life-sustaining that we know you have to take as a, as a person who lives in the public. And that's a violation based on your status of being homeless. And that's, and that's unconstitutional. And I, I totally agree with you. My thing is 13th Amendment to the Constitution clearly states that slavery is abolished except for those punished the crimes within the United States and Congress shall have the power to push that by proper legislation. So if states come up underneath federal guidelines, minimum standards, and the state is using this, this is not a federal thing to be homeless, and that's not a crime, a federal crime, correct? 
Okay, so it's a state, you know what I'm saying? So therefore, why is it that Colorado becoming one of the richest states in America due to the marijuana thing, you know, whatever? Anyway, uh, that's where we need to focus on because they're utilizing the top, you know what I'm saying, the federal guidelines to enslave people, not criminally. I mean, yeah, the crime is the, that's the part, but at the same time, yeah, they're still enacting slavery here in America. Am I right or wrong? Under the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Right. I'm probably not going to step into the issue of whether or not it's true in America. But thank you for your point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm an artist. I just got something to share. It's called Small Things. Now, why is it that these days when a stranger meets another stranger and says hello or happy holidays, it's not met with a happy holidays or with a bro? It's usually met with silence, but mostly fear. What, have we lost sight of the simplest of things, like a kind gesture, or asking if something's okay when we see the fall when they're running for the bus and not laugh? Now don't count me out, because I know that I'm guilty too. What, have we wore our masks so long that it clouds our real view, so we only look for the bad everywhere? What, no good can beat its way through? Now, from where I sit, or excuse me, I mean to say from my viewpoint, if we do let down these hardened fronts and show a lighter, or if you can, a softer side, for the ones that you let in, use it to abuse you and harm, now, I don't know how much time's left, but if you're a God-fearing person as I am, you know the prophecies are upon us, so it looks like there's not too much. Will we be able to chisel enough away in time, or be left outside in the storm? Now, I've started to lose sight of myself. Maybe it's time for me to take a look back at my own story, and see how much I pulled, <laughs> ripped off of my own mask, to see how much good shows through. .edu backslash homeless dash advocacy dash policy dash dash project and it's on there's a whole stack of flyers up here that has that, that has the website on it so you can pick it up there and it's in the report thanks uh, marcus this person it can't go over there because of the camera can he ask a question uh, sure i don't know if the mic is over i think it's talk loud just talk loud one of the things that i noticed that you mentioned was the representation of people who are going before the courts and they're being represented by attorneys. That does not happen when you go before courts. Primarily, you go before a magistrate and people who are, being, who are actually seeing the judges are representing themselves. They have to contend with a city attorney and the judge. So that's factored into your financial equation. So that's, well, you mentioned that when you did your financial projection. So that's skewed. Also, you have a lay person who is actually trying to arbitrate a court case contending with a magistrate or a judge and a city attorney. Oftentimes, they don't have time to prepare for their cases, they don't know the law, and they're being, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're having to stand before the court with this judge and a city attorney looking at their criminal history, and there, there's not representation in a, in a systematic way. So, without taking that into consideration, some of those numbers are going to fall. Well, as you said, they're underrepresented for those reasons. Um, and so we did. So I might have misspoken or misunderstanding, but I do want to clarify. The number for adjudications was $174 per case, and that it does not count for any public defender that is appointed to an individual. Um, explicitly for the reason that this gentleman just explained is that um, a lot of people do not get attorneys. They, um, they basically adjudicate their cases or go in front of a magistrate um, and plead out their case so that they can get um, out of custody. So our $174. Representation. That's one thing that you actually don't get at that level of court. So our $174 does not account for the cost. Um, it only accounts for the city attorney as well as the judge and the court clerk's cost. We get, uh, obtain that number through the city of Denver. Applications with not having an attorney in those settings. Sorry. And I'll, I'll add one last thing. That, besides the loud noise. Um, it, Particularly interesting is Boulder and their camping ban, which we saw has a huge number of citations. Uh, recently, the University of Colorado's law school in Boulder has started uh, through their 
at one of their clinics to have law students uh, defend the, the camping ban for individuals who are homeless. Um, and this is all tied into a few years ago in 2012 uh, where they tried to change the penalty so there was no jail time so there might not be a right to a jury trial that was struck down and so there's been this huge fight about the representation and what actually happens and how much the courts get clogged with these small offenses when they actually have someone to represent them, represent them who has legal training. Hi there, I'm a 2006 graduate of the DU Storm College of Law and I also work in the student office and so I appreciate your interest in this incredibly complicated issue. And, I've, and if you noticed, um, Warren has explicit steps outlined for officers, and they have to look and they have to evaluate the medical needs, they also have to evaluate the human services needs, and the very last resort is issuing a citation. So did you guys track that in the Denver ordinance? Or are there other ordinances that look the same? Um, I, I mean, I think uh, that's kind of the same thing that we said before, which those steps, we don't have any ac really accurate way to track other than, uh, like you said, the Denver section, there's a small piece, so we have a small snapshot of it. There's not a good way for us to have gotten that information to what we did. And then I'm also interested in the disposition, disposition of the cases. I'm interested to know how many of the cases were dismissed, because I know it's a common practice in uh, municipal prosecutors um, to, once the, once the individual has come in, once they've self-identified as homeless, at that point, um, they'll say, I want you to meet with a counselor. I want you to try to connect with some services. And once you can come back and prove that you've done that, we'll dismiss the charges. Did you track when that happened or how often that happened? Um, we did not track. We weren't able to, in the case disposition, it doesn't state if uh, you know they were offered services. We did not, in our cost evaluation, count any citation that did have a dismissal because we felt that that would um, alter the accuracy of our numbers. Um, we would love the opportunity to have that information. I think that that is where a level of transparency doesn't exist right now. Um, but I think there's also, if you go out into the community, you know, D-Hole has done some interviews that state that um, over 200 homeless individuals explicitly talked about multiple, um, multiple experiences with police officers, specifically based off of the camping ban, yet not getting a citation. So um, that's broken out a little bit more in the report. And can I, I'm sorry, can I just jump in with the answer to that really quick? Because I happen to know. Um, so um, for our, the, in 2013, we did a camping ban survey of about 500 people in Colorado about the effect of the camping ban. Um, and uh, so we asked questions about police contact, about uh, tickets, about uh, getting access to services, these sorts of things. Um, you'd have to look at the, the report to get the full, the full findings, but what it turned out to was the things that had to do with police contact, uh, with getting moved on, with getting, uh, with getting arrested for other charges like FTAs, those things were the highest percentages, and then the graph shrinks to at the bottom is where you have getting, um, getting help in, in accessing a service. That happens at the bottom. It was some 2% of the people that we surveyed, or maybe it was 4%, um, that said that a police officer actually helped them to, to get some sort of service that was actually helpful to them. Um, that could go, we could go into that a lot more detail, but that the camping ban report really shows that what's happening is being moved on and, and, um, and having that regular police contact um, and not the access to services. And, and Ray could probably add on to that also. Uh, probably three times a week. No cop comes and says, hey, why don't you come along with me? I can show you what to do. What they say is at 5 o'clock in the morning, when it's 6 degrees out, get up and move. That's what they tell us. So all this, this, this little piece of paper they have with the, the procedures, they don't follow any of them. None of them do. I've had a couple of them say, do you want shelter? And then, then they just, if, I've actually seen them when a guy said, yeah. I want shelter. Left them there when they left. So uh, their procedures are nice for a website, and they look good when you're holding them in the hand. What they actually do are two different things. And that piece that you said about them telling you in court that they'll dismiss your case if you've shown that you've made taking steps to try, that does not happen. So Absolutely gonna, does not happen. I'm going to give her uh, a chance to respond uh, clearly. Uh, whether whether or not uh, a court or a police officer offers someone a service, 
is not the same question of whether the police officer ought to be harassing that person in the first place. Well, thank you for addressing the question. And then just in terms of solutions, it's an incredibly complex question. The solutions are really tough. So I appreciate that you guys mentioned the recovery courts. And then just one more thing, which is the city is actually putting $47 million towards services for indigent and people experiencing homelessness this year in 2016. And so I think that rather than vilifying the cities, that using them as a partner in order to provide the services, because they're definitely committed to uh, all members of the community, and those in need are a priority as well. Services which are more expensive than housing. Print? I just wondered if you had looked into uh, driver's license abuses um, by, by police or, or courts at all. Short answer is no. Okay. Because <laughs> I am suing for that in federal court because okay. they won't give me my driver's license back. I've already beaten them in, in county, Jeffco County Court. Um, so they still won't give it back. Uh, we did address that. There is a very, very small section that talks about uh, issues with losing property because of having to leave and bring it inside to a courthouse and issues like that. But we didn't, yeah, we didn't examine that in depth. Yeah, just two quick questions. Uh, with regards to the data set, did you find that most of the information that you got from the city was in the database format or was it in a written format? First, and then second, um, if in database format, the cost should be relatively lower because they could just send you an email. Right, 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 right. The request statute because that's <coughs> only for individual records. So if they compile any data, they don't need to turn it over to somebody under CORA or CCJRA, the two open records uh, ordinances. Uh, there were a number of cities that gave us beautiful Excel spreadsheets that made our analysis really easy. There were cities that just gave us a list of citations um, and did no analysis. So it totally varies city to city, but we did get the best responses from cities that kept their data uh, in a database already because they then they didn't charge us a bunch of staff time to go and pull that information. So there were a number of cities that gave us robust responses at no charge. Great. So uh, another. Uh, the last two. There would be great. Two. Great. Um, uh, let's say three. Three. Okay. Three. Okay. Three. Okay. Three. Great. Thank you for your patience. Hi, um, I really appreciate the use of numbers. I'm a sociologist, so thank you for statistics. They're useful, especially if they're done right. Um, and I'm looking forward to DP going into this a little bit more. The thing that kind of jumps out at me the most is that there is there's an intention behind these ordinances, and there's an intention to criminalize a certain group of people, obviously. I feel like when we follow the money, and we follow the money trail, obviously you have to enforce these laws, right? And there's money and intention being put towards that. So who is back, I, mean, I don't know if your information told you this, but who is backing a lot of these ordinances and, <clears throat> and giving support to that and giving um, power to that? Um, because I feel like in the same intention that you could be giving towards criminalizing folks, you could also be giving intention to right. giving and providing services for them. So, where did you keep, did you read anything, get anything so, about that? Yeah, you who know, makes as, money for incarcerating these as folks? As lawyers, you know, we, we're very careful about placing intent, right, on, on, on what what's there. Where you could have seen that would have been if in enacting the ordinance, the city councils had some sort of legislative history, right, which they do on the state level, they do on the federal level, but not in the local level. And so if they had been a reporter that had written down what our city legislators and policymakers are saying while they are putting these into, into law, then we would have had that as a, as a way of researching and then making conclusions about whether or not the intention was in line with what it seems to be. Um, we don't have that in Colorado. So that may be another way that we can have a more transparent government would be if the city councils did have some sort of legislative history that was searchable by researchers like yourself. Okay. Right, that would be who the cities are paying to have people incarcerated. A lot of money. So Denver Homeless Out Loud through Western Regional Advocacy Project, we've been working to um, expose the role of 
business improvement districts in this uh, national epidemic of criminalization, and there is information on uh, on business improvement districts on our website and on Western Regional Advocacy Project's websites. Uh, they're a really fascinating thing because business improvement districts take uh, public money through a, a special tax, and they don't have a democratic process, but they endorse things like um, like camping bans, like zip lies. In fact, most of the time, they're the ones to write the ordinances, and um, yet they don't have a democratic process to vote on uh, which ordinance they're going to support. It's usually uh, the people with the most amount of money within a business district. So. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, <clears throat> in Boulder, I, I saw you had just the pan when you were camping. You said there was 351 different types. Did you look into um, tickets for people who sleep in your cars? Because that is a key issue up there. So we did we did catalog those ordinances, and in some cities we requested the data about how many people were getting those citations. Uh, we didn't include it in our cost calculations because we didn't have enough information for to calculate the cost of enforcing the living in a vehicle ordinances. Um, but that information is reflected in the ordinance survey, and we did receive some open record request data about those ordinances. Yeah. Thank you. And last question. Um, get to be last. Thank, thank you again for all this work. Um, as a, a resident of the newly termed Rhino, um, the only thing that, that kind of struck me as odd, and I was hoping you'd be kind of uh, talk about your thought process, was um, in terms of public urination defecation um, with the number of bars, I know that that's not limited to homeless. However, um, the number of folks I've run into who are homeless would prefer not to be doing that as well. Um, so I wondered why your solution was, I mean, that's really the only thing that actually is a health risk, not only to the house, but also to the homeless. Um, I wondered why your solution was ban that law instead of shift that money and effort to more public restrooms and facilities um, so that folks are uh, safer and uh, have a little bit of privacy, really. Thanks. We definitely agree with that assertion, and I apologize if we communicated that the solution to all 351 ordinances is to get rid of them. Uh, I think the solution for the public urination and defecation problem is that there need to be publicly available restrooms 24 hours a day in locations that work for people who need them. Uh, and that is not true in any of the cities we surveyed. So the problem is when you have those ordinances on the books and you write people's citations and you take them to court and possibly to jail for something that they couldn't have avoided. So maybe those laws would be fine uh, if there were restrooms, but they are not. So the problem is enforcing them when you have no other option. If I can just jump in really quick for the, uh, or did somebody else want to answer this? Uh, just to answer that from a, from a, uh, the right to rest angle, the right to rest act does not include the right to urinate. <laughs> it does not include the right to poop on people's doorsteps. Um, the, the larger homeless bill of rights campaign does include uh, an effort towards opening up uh, hygiene facilities and restrooms. Yeah. Um, but that's a part of the larger homeless bill of rights campaign. The right to rest act does not say you have a right to pee on somebody's doorstep. Exactly. And, uh, and just to be clear, that's that's the real thing behind this bill is we're never going to have the political will to end homelessness if we're busy violating people's rights. If we're busy trying to criminalize people, we're never going to have enough housing, we're never going to have enough public restrooms if we think the answer is to call the cops. So who is, who is closing us out? Right. 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 Is, is unconstitutional. We have not taken a look at whether or not these ordinances violate different types of constitutional amendments or claims or statutory claims. So we really focused on sort of whether or not when you say you can't sit here, you know, when, you, when an ordinance says you can't um, lay down here in this public place, you can't put a blanket on you, really what they're doing is they're saying we are, we are prohibiting actions that are life-sustaining that we know you have to take as a, as a person who lives in the public. 
and that's a violation based on your status of being homeless, and that's and that's unconstitutional. And I, I totally agree with you. My thing is, 13th Amendment to the Constitution clearly states that slavery is abolished except for those punished for crimes within the United States, and Congress shall have the power to push that by proper legislation. <coughs> So if states come up underneath federal guidelines, minimum standards, and the state is using this, this is not a federal thing to be homeless, and that's not a crime, it's a federal crime, correct? Okay, so it's a state, you know what I'm saying? So therefore, why is it that Colorado becoming one of the richest states in America due to the marijuana thing, you know, whatever it is? Anyway, uh, that's where we need to focus on, because they're utilizing the top, you know what I'm saying, the federal guidelines to enslave people, not criminally. I mean, yeah, cr the crime is the, that's the part. But at the same time, yeah, there's still an act of slavery here in America. Am I right or wrong under the 13th Amendment to the Constitution? Right, I'm probably not going to step into the issue of whether or not there's slavery so. in America. <laughs> but thank you for your point. <laughs> Happy holidays. It's not met with a happy holidays or with oh, bro. She's met with silence, but mostly fear. What have we lost sight of the simplest of things, like a kind gesture, or asking if something's okay when we see the ball when they're running for the bus and not laugh? Now don't count me out, cause I know that I'm guilty too. What have we wore our masks so long that it clouds our real view, so we only look for the bad everywhere? What no good can beat its way through? Now, from where I sit, or excuse me, I'm going to say from my viewpoint, if we do let down these hardened fronts and show a lighter, or if you can, a softer side, for the ones that you let in, use it to abuse you and harm. Now, I don't know how much time is left, but if you're a God-fearing person as I am, you know the prophecies are upon us, so it looks like there's not too much. Will we be able to chisel enough to wait in time, or be left outside in the storm? Now, I've started to decide myself. Maybe it's time for me to take a look back at my own story and see how much I pulled ripped off of my own ass to see how much good shows through. I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, um, our understanding is that the major um, objection to the Right to Rest Act um, comes from places like the Colorado Municipal League and um, saying that this is a matter of local control and that cities don't want to give up local control. And I think you've made the point real well throughout that this is a statewide concern. But so one of my questions is I'm wondering, as you do this work and think about it, you know, what do you see as the real underlying, perhaps unstated reason why there is such objection to uh, the Right to Rest Act. And the second question is, gee, 15 or was it 16 citations for the urban um, camping ban doesn't sound like much. Can you comment on that and help people understand what's really going on there? Is it that we have such a kind and compassionate city? Probably not. That's a lot of the, the work I've looked at, which is, as we've tried to emphasize time and time again, I think you're right. That's a huge undercount of the actual impact of the camping ban. What we have is people who are actually cited. We don't have any time that a police officer offered to move a law order or any time that the police um, just contact someone talking about the camping ban and ask them to move on whether or not it was even recorded that way. So while we have only 15 actual citations, you're right that the impact is almost certainly higher than that. If you look in the Denver City Spotlight, there's a specific breakout on um, that focuses on kind of the disproportionality between the citations and the police contacts. Um, so pull out the city section. I would also say that the 1,000 trespass citations issued to homeless individuals a year in Denver might uh, reflect that they're using a different ordinance to, to target some of the behavior that maybe Boulder is using their camping ban to target. Um, so just a time check, how much time do we have left uh, for question and answer? Um, we could probably take one more. Uh, take one more? Okay, so if you'd like to oh, ask, right. ask a question. Uh, right. We will stay as long as we need to stay. Nancy's saying uh, the first part of your question about local control, um, 
uh, she'd like to reiterate that. But I have a question. We are out of reports, so. Uh, um, it's on our website. Uh, so what is that website? How can people? If you them? Google, <laughs> but if you Google BU Law School homelessness, it's the it is the first link. Sometimes if you Google something else, the link is broken, and we're fixing that. But if you Google DU Law School Homeless, um, it pulls up our link and all of our reports, Excel spreadsheets, um, as well as the city spotlights are there. I think that's the easiest way to get there. Google. And so knocking down one, which some um, courts have done, just means another one pops up. And so having a statewide protection is so necessary. We just have a, you know, in Colorado, we have a, a reputation of local governments, right? That we, we sort of, um, we are known for that. Um, but we also have a state constitution. That means, um, and that means that we know, we recognize the fact that there needs to be rights and protections for those underneath our state constitution and our state rights. And so we are advocating for that. I think another part of your question went to why people um, oppose it. And there are different reasons, and we don't know all those reasons, but one of the reasons why we look at all the individual cities is that it shows they have their own interests, their own reasons for pushing it. Some of them care deeply about tourism. So in Colorado Springs, uh, there was a big battle over the last few months for a sit lie law in the downtown area, and they just passed it, unfortunately, but that goes to just their downtown areas. That's not a citywide um, ordinance ban. It was specifically in the two areas where there's a lot of businesses and there's a lot of tourism. Uh, different areas in the state, Durango, Grand Junction on the west side, don't have as much of an issue as Denver and Boulder do with that. Um, but they're more dependent on the energy market, so their homelessness fluctuates and they have limited funds for providing actual housing. So the broad overall reasons, I can't say, but different cities and different businesses oppose it for their own reasons. 